I want to begin my chapel by welcoming everyone here that is supporting me <clears throat> this morning. Whew, okay. As I look into the pews, I see family members. I see members from FCA and sorority sisters, uh, professors, members of the tennis team, um, all that have had a huge impact on the story that I'm gonna share with you this morning. So thank you all for being, being here, and I cannot tell you how much your support means to me. I wanna say that I've been looking forward to this moment for a really long time, but I have also been dreading this moment for a very long time. <laughs> This moment that I'd be giving up and sharing my senior chapel. First off, public speaking is not my favorite thing in the world, and by giving this chapel, I have come to the fact, it took terms with, I'm a senior, and I'm gonna be graduating May 18th, just 35 short days away. So to be honest, giving this chapel is pretty much the worst. <laughs> What am I just, just leave, no, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, <laughs> but if you are listening, I did say that I've been looking forward to this moment for a long time, and that is the truth. I've been waiting for this moment to speak to my friends, my family, and the Westminster community, and to share how God has been at work in my life. Thinking every time that I've sat in those pews, what story am I gonna share when it's my turn to stand up behind that podium? For everyone who's been around me <laughs> when I've had a story to share, then you know how much I love to tell stories. When it's something I'm really excited about, I tend to share the same story multiple times. I think it's really good. I'm probably gonna tell everyone I encounter, perhaps saying it multiple times to the same person before I realize it's the third or fourth time they've heard this story. As the story progresses, I almost guarantee that each time my voice will get louder and higher as I get excited about my words. Side note, my friends said that I started to sound like Jesse from Toy Story, so if you need that auditory you know, reference, I don't know what that means, but before I ramble too much, because I gotta save that for later, um, you get the point, I like to tell stories. So today, I have a story to share with you. This is a story that I cannot claim to be my own, but rather someone else's story that I've gotten to be a part of. It's a story that is not always pretty, it's not always happy, it's not always appropriate, but it's my story, um, not my story. Um, it's one that's honest, it's passionate, and it's one that I approach with great humility. To provide a little background, I have been beyond blessed to grow up in a loving Christian home, in a family where having a personal relationship with Christ was of great importance. Getting the opportunity to witness both of my parents commit their lives to Christ, I have seen how incredible God's mercy and grace truly is. Growing up, I can't point to the exact moment in my life when I first accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, but there are several moments where I recognized and reaffirmed this amazing truth. These moments of affirmation serve as testimonies to God's unfailing grace in my life. In order to explain how I ended up at Westminster, I must tell you about my seventh grade confirmation. When I was confirmed in my church, I was to select someone to be my mentor. The person I chose name was John Lewis, and every week we would meet to talk about my faith, doubts, and what it meant to be journey joining the church. The, clo the location we chose to meet, McDonald's. If you're feeling any surge of jealousy right now, you should be, because he was the best mentor ever. And I like to think that I remember everything that he told me, all those words of wisdom and guidance, but if I'm being completely honest with you, a lot has slipped my mind. However, there are two lessons that John taught me that I will always carry with me. First, when John talked to me about making room for God in my life. I remember sitting in the booth, and as I listed all the things I was involved in, I remembered listing things like three or four sports, piano lessons, after school programs, the list went on and on. And after we were done adding up all the hours, he looked at me and laughed. He confessed the point was to show that I had plenty of time in my day to spend in time with God in word and in prayer. But he did not know what to do with my schedule. <laughs> the next point he made was that I could bring glory to God in all those activities. And even with my I want to do everything kind of schedule, there was still plenty of time I could spend in personal devotion to God. The other words of wisdom were not John's words, but they rather came through a song. A song that is a very popular hymn. It's Here I Am, Lord. It's classic, right? Who doesn't love that hymn? Um, it's a hymn, hymn that a handful of girls, girls and I sang in church with John, and a hymn that holds a dear place in my heart. Why? Because I don't sing. <laughs> I am a terrible singer. And when I was asked to sing with them, I thought, just an acoustic guitar and four girls singing. This was not the children's choir where I could just move my lips and no one could know that I wasn't actually singing the words. Anyone know what I'm talking about? It's 
probably news to my parents. They thought my brother just did that. Um, <laughs> but anyways, after a lot of stubbornness, John took me aside and talked to me about how I didn't have to sing. But by doing so, I was giving praise to God and saying, I am going to trust you. I was essentially saying, here I am. At that time, I did not think much of the experience. The significance came through the years of how this song worked in my life. Over the next few years, every time I encountered that song, I remembered the lessons that I learned and so many more to come. It seemed that every time I felt lost or confused about who I was or what I was doing with my life, that song came and that song reaffirmed that I was not the one leading the way. So getting back to how I ended up at Westminster. My older sister Dana went to Westminster. She also played on the tennis team and was probably a far better student than I was. But anyways, I remember when she came to visit Westminster um, and she was deciding where she should go, um, I told her she should definitely go here. There was something about this place that I couldn't put my finger on, but something that it made it feel like home. At that time, I was in seventh grade, and really I had no idea what I was talking about. But when it came time for me to look at schools, my junior and senior year of high school, of course I did not forget what I had told my sister that visitation day. I remember looking at Westminster, but I also looked at eight other schools. I remember stressing out completely, struggling on where I should go. Even if everyone around me knew, I probably would end up at Westminster. That reassurement did not come until I came to visit the school and I went to chapel. As I opened the bulletin, immediately my eyes were drawn to the words in the middle of the page. Here I am, Lord. It was the first hymn we sang. The words served as God's way of telling me I was in the right place. It also didn't hurt that the Hueys were sitting in the pew right behind me, and in perfect Huey fashion, they greeted me like I was already family. What is not to love about that? But what, what I've failed to share with you, though, is that during these last few years of high school and into my college, my college years, I struggled immensely. That struggle came with a struggle of identity. From an extremely young age, I'd always had this weird obsession with going to church, never wanting to leave. I would stay after and talk to the pastor um, about the sermon. I'd go home and still be talking to my parents about the sermon. And I say weird because I was that kid that took her Bible to school just to show her teacher the colored tabs I added to divide all the books of the Bible. <laughs> that same seventh grade science teacher that asked on the first day of school what everyone wanted to be when they grew up. Most kids were responding with, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a teacher. I answered, I want to be a Christian education director. Who says that? <laughs> no one says that. I was a weird kid. <laughs> I don't think I ever lost my identity as being that church girl, but during my junior and senior year of high school, don't think I didn't try. Over the years, I grew to love the idea of serving alongside others, and after attending service trips like the five summers I spent at the Pittsburgh Project with my church, I knew that I wanted to make missions a part of my life, and that was more recently affirmed when I traveled to Nicaragua two summers ago. However, at the same time this passion for mission was developing, my friends and I were getting involved with the typical not-so-good life choices that high school students tend to make. Originally, I remember going to parties thinking, I can be here, and I can be a witness for Christ. I mean, that's totally what Jesus would do, right? At first, I refrained from partaking in anything that would make my parents blush, but slowly the focus moved away from me being a witness, and it slowly turned into this savior mentality. I could be there, and I could help them. What I learned next was despite the way I was acting, I was not Jesus. <laughs> Big news flash. Um, the more I went out on weekends, the more I slowly drifted, and the more it wasn't about me, it was not about anyone else, and it was, it was more about me. It was not about anyone else, and it was definitely not about God. Senior year, I hit a low point in my life. I was still going to church every Sunday, really involved, but there were a number of Sundays when I sit in, would sit in the pew, and I would repent of everything that happened the night before, recommitting myself to Christ. It was this constant up and down, feeling like God was right next to me, and life could not be any better. To a few weeks later, wondering where he went. Why did he leave me? The worst part was that I believed God was calling me to a religious vocation. And when it was time to decide my major, I definitely wanted to study religion at school. I remember breaking down one Sunday at church in front of another mentor of mine, Dave Whipple. All I could say was, Dave, you don't understand. I am not the person you fully think I am. There's no way I can pursue any church vocation. I have messed up and I am not good enough. He took a hold of me, and Dave isn't a small guy either, and he grabbed my shoulders and looked into my eyes and said, none of us are good enough. Yep, that's what it took. That reminder that as much as I was telling other people that we are broken people and we live in a broken world, 
I was setting myself to a different standard. I was not living in Christ, but pretending like somehow I was above all of that brokenness. In college, I continued to learn this lesson. The best part about Westminster, though, I was surrounded by a number of people, like my church and my family back home, people that truly loved me and would never let me forget that, yes, I was doing a lot of dumb things, but no matter what, his mercies were never ending. That as much as I didn't feel good enough, I was fair enough for him. Christ loved me, brokenness and all, and he would use that brokenness to share Christ with other people. Looking back at my time at Westminster, there were a lot of struggles. During my freshman year of college, for example, I woke up one Saturday morning to a phone call from my dad. In a panic and with a shaky voice, he told me that my mother had just fallen down a flight of concrete steps and landed on her neck. Immediately, the worst thoughts came to my mind. Thoughts of losing my mother at age 18, trying to figure out how my family would recover or function, with, re recover or function without her in our lives, and an overwhelming sense of sadness, fear, and anger. Immediately, I acted. I drove to the hospital within a few hours to be there with my dad and to wait for any information the doctors could give me about my mother's condition. Fortunately for my family, my anxieties about my mother's accident proved to be unneeded. After surgery and what I'm convinced to be a miracle from God, my mother was eventually blessed, <laughs> released from the hospital and was, was with the potential to make a full recovery. However, the weeks and even months following my mother's accident were emotionally and physically draining. My faith was challenged in this time because I could not understand why God allowed my mother to suffer and more selfishly, why he would allow this worry to be placed on the people that loved her so dearly. 